Thank you very, very much. Um, I had a, a, a rather detailed um, introduction to our keynote speaker, Todd Rose, but I am just too eager to get to him and to share his ideas with you because I have had the pleasure of hearing him speak live once. Uh, subsequent to that, I have studied him on YouTube and I urge you to do the same. But what we need to do right now is wind him up and let him go. Come on, Todd. Thanks. I do actually come from that place at the other side of the red line. Um, <laughs> and I feel a little uh, uh, strange to be here to tell you why I think you guys are going to actually win. What I want to do today over the next six hours, uh, <laughs> I'll keep it to I actually want to make an argument that the things that we're learning from the modern learning sciences, in particular neuroscience, which is sort of where I spend most of my time, actually has revealed a lot about the nature of learning that needs to come together at the same time as these new technologies, including learning analytics, uh, to really get us to that revolution. And that I do believe that, that UMass is strategically positioned to lead, not just benefit from it. Um, and, you know, you hear a lot of uh, hype out there, right? I mean, it seems like every day there's a new startup. Um, sometimes people are getting millions of dollars for, and they don't even have anything yet, right? <laughs> so we might be in the wrong business right now. Yeah. But um, I would say there is a lot of promise that's it's there. But to get there is a longer game than a lot of the people, a lot of the hype that's being generated that's actually not going to be productive. And I think that we may be at risk of chasing the wrong problem. And I want to make an argument that the single biggest barrier to realizing the potential of e-learning, this new revolution, whether it's from design or learning analytics, is actually a myth. And it's this myth of the average learner. And even those of us that say, well, we don't really think that. We know that people are different. First of all, we're really different we have a much deeper sense for the ways that we are different and the kinds of differences that we can design for and deal with effectively through analytics. But the thing is, even when we say we appreciate that, the truth is the myth shows up. It shows up in the design of our instructional environments, where in a lot of areas it's still okay to create a curriculum that is built for an average, you know, sophomore. <laughs> what do they know on average? Because in the past, in the print medium, we didn't have much of a choice. There wasn't the kind of flexibility that technology affords us. But I'm going to say this average is going to be particularly devastating in analytics, where the potential for customization, adaptability, or these buzzwords that we hear, people say them all the time, and then, and yet, when you scratch the surface, they're using average models. Now, unless there's some magic that I'm not aware of, I don't know how you get to personalization through average, right? But that's the talk that's going on. So I want to make a case for variability and a case for uh, needing you to really understand just how different we are and then why it matters in the context of learning and design and analytics, because I do think it is central to allowing UMass to lead. And so I'm going to do that with two things. I want to take you through what we know about variability using neuroscience, just a little bit. And then um, I want to use Rubik's Cube to show you just how important it is. So from a neuroscience standpoint, and this will just be a, a brief overview, you know, we've gone from having, uh, and I participated in this, by the way, in research, sort of a, a looking at spaces in the brain. <laughs> and you saw like Time Magazine, this is the area for love or whatever, you know. It was like glorified phrenology, right? But we have moved beyond that, and modern neuroscience is focused on networks and their characteristics. And what's really important about it, knowing that is what we're learning about the properties of these networks. The first is that they are highly variable. They're just, it wouldn't even make sense to have a brain with networks that has one pathway to something. You, know, you want rich redundancies. But that these, this variability is not just a property of your brain. You know, that's a dangerous proposition itself, right? That we start to like try to figure out how to classify people and put all the stuff inside them, whether it's a category like disability or a style or something like that. But in fact, 
the, the variability is coming from the biology interacting with context and experience. And that's more than metaphor. We actually have a deeper understanding about the origins of that variability and how to design for it. So I want to use a quick example of perception. Because I think you have to actually feel it. When I say we're variable, you, I think even though people that say well, I agree, it's like you need to know we're really variable and it matters. So I just want to take you through what it could normally be a pretty boring topic, although I, I like it. Uh, you know, let's just say you're just going to take some sensory information in right now. And it's the gatekeeper for all of learning. So if, if perception's not working right, you know, you're in trouble. So I just want to take you through a couple of steps in that process, a real abbreviated version, just to show you how variability arises naturally in this process of trying to make sense of your world. Okay? So I'm just going to, we'll talk about just detecting information, integrating sensory signals, um, selecting appropriate information out of your environment, and then, crucially, the importance of goals, which is often neglected in science, but not so much by educators, I think. Okay, so by the way, how many of you have heard of the ringtones that, that high school kids can hear, but the teachers can't? Okay, if you haven't, because you probably haven't heard them, right? Like <laughs> the, I have them in my, uh, my oldest son gave them to me. I just wanted just as a, to show you in terms of detection. We vary like, uh, these are it. All I want you to do is I'm going to play a few tones. If you can hear it, raise your hand. See, the, he, Dennis is eager to please. That's the, um, the, if you can hear it, raise your hand, and then just keep your hand up as we go through until you cannot hear one. And then you can look around in envy at the younger people in the audience. Um, okay, here we go. Ready? Okay, keep your hands up, if you, and then here comes the next one. Here comes the next one. So by the way, the next one, I put these yellow little lights, not, for, not, not to be good design, but because I can't hear this next one, so I don't know when it goes off or not. Wow, not too bad. Keep your hands up if you can hear it. Here we go. Now we're getting into the... Whoa. This is pretty impressive. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Wow, you still... Okay, keep your hands up. Here we go. This is, now we're getting into like serious, yeah, dog whistle territory. So th here we go. Wow. Okay, this is, this is, this is pushing the, the, the record for, okay, here we go. We still have like five, it's ridiculous. Now I'm going to, I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to play one more, which is, the, ready? Here's this one. Let's see. I would be shocked if anyone can hear this. Wow. Okay, now I'll go ahead and give you a secret, which is this last one I was going to play is fake. It's to <laughs> detect cheaters. Uh, so I wouldn't even, because I have no problem exposing people who didn't. Um, so here's the thing. That's a, it's a silly example for detection because th there's no real information being carried at that frequency. But of course, if there was, and you couldn't even detect it, learning's already over, right? So it's a, it's a silly example, but I'm gonna get, it gets much cooler than that. So let's just pretend that everyone has been detecting things just fine right now. You've got your visual information, you've got your auditory information, now you gotta start making sense of it, integrating it. Now I have to say, uh, oh, we, in psychology and neuroscience, we sort of had a nice little wishful thinking for a long time, which was, okay, eventually sensory information gets integrated, but early on, not so much, they don't really, crosstalk. That would have been lovely if that were true. Um, turns out that's not true. And I'm going to show you, and I have to say, it, we don't really quite know what to do with this yet, but when you start inter integrating different senses, what I want you to do is just close your eyes, and I'll kick one of you. No, I'm just kidding. That <laughs> My wife said that's called antisocial behavior, so. Um, and says so she's over there drawing pictures for me. I feel like I better obey her. Um, so I want you just to listen to what he says, okay? And here we go. Okay. How many of you heard ba with a B? By the way, I won't ask if you heard anything else. We'll talk afterwards. The, uh, now I want you to, to, same thing, I want you to look at him wh while you listen. Ba, 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 ba. 
How many of you heard da with a D? How about ga with a G? So I'm going to play it one more time, and I want you to try to manipulate it yourself. Open and close your eyes on repeating ones and see how you can fundamentally change what you hear by the visual signal. Ba, 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 ba. So here's what's interesting. The trick is that it, the, the verbal information is actually ba with a B. The visual signal is ga with a G. But the difference is just articulation, which is very subtle. Now, what I find fascinating is even then, so okay, so you can manipulate what you hear based on what you see, but notice even in this case, you still have variability. Some of you heard ga with a G. If you're a linguist, if you have better vision, if you can resolve finer details, then once your brain can cue in that this is ga, it will make you hear ga. Most of us, it's da, ga, or it's ba, ga, split the middle, good enough for government work, go home, right? Like, it's really, you're just trying to survive, get by, you know? But the fact is, is that even in the integration of sensory information, you get variability naturally. This is, I think, really important, particularly when it comes to e-learning, because we can do things in the digital environment with contrast and motion, things like this, that is harder to do in natural settings for better or for worse. And I think we actually end up destroying attention in the moment of learning without realizing it. But this is important because attention is fundamentally about selection. You really need, in terms of your brain, you want the ability, say your visual system captures a lot of information on the retina every second, but you can only process a very, very, very small sliver of that information. The problem is, in real time, you don't know which is going to be important and which is not. So the trick is to remember is attention is about selecting something from the environment always at the expense of other things, always. But the thing is, it wasn't like you could just uh, like remember it down the road. It was not available to be learned. And it's interesting, that, and I wonder in the context of sort of the day in day aspects of a classroom environment or an online class, just it's shocking that anybody ever ends up with the same experience and what you choose to pay attention to. And I want to say the reason this is important is from a neuroscience standpoint, we have a deep sense for not only the importance of attention because it's going to orient and decide what it is you perceive, which then determines what's possible to learn, but also the importance of goals in deciding that. And from a neuroscience standpoint, the brain does nothing without a goal. It is fundamentally goal-directed. And this is true in learning. And look, educators have known this, right? You do a lesson plan. Your first thing is, what's your goal, <laughs> right? But the trick is, it's, it's really important here, particularly in online learning, because the medium is about all you have, right? You, you don't have necessarily the same instructor who can read a classroom in the moment and shift gears. That's the trade-off. There's a lot more flexibility and things we can do in that environment that may be worth the trade-off. But the thing is, is that we know that how often when you make a goal, if you know that everyone here is goal-oriented all the time, and I'm trying to teach you calculus, and in a moment I don't actually tell you what the goal of the learning experience is, what are the odds that you're actually going to pick the goal I thought you should? But the thing is, if you pick a different goal, it orients the whole experience, and it can misalign the sort of learning elements that I've put in place to get you to some outcome. So it turns out goals end up being profoundly important. And I'm going to tell you why I ha I'll owe my son $20 for, sh for showing this. Um, just to I want to just make the point about goals a little more salient. So this is actually uh, my son, Nathan, when he was in fifth grade. Um, and uh, not, uh, unfortunately, the kid that's happy. How's that? <laughs> Which normally would be a good thing, but if you take a close look, it, it, something's really wrong, right? <laughs> so Nathan, um, sweet kid, never really causes any problems. You know, he's in school here, and uh, the teacher is a friend of ours, which is good for Nathan. Yeah. The teacher likes to tell me, well, look, Nathan's a sweetheart. He's not very goal-directed sometimes. <laughs> say, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, and around the holidays, we get an email that just says, has this picture attached? And it says, happy holidays. See what I mean? Okay, a little passive aggressive, that's okay. I'm not so worried about that. 
Except for I am worried when I look at the picture, like, why is he happy? Like, things have really gone wrong, and he's overly excited about it. So before I called the psychologist, I, I thought I would talk to my son, like a good parent, and I said, you know, Nathan, what's going on? And he gets excited again. He's like, oh, you can't see it yet. It's on display. We have to wait till the holidays are over. And I thought, well, first of all, now I know why the teacher's not happy. I'm like, look what our kids made, you know. But so here's, here's I said, tell me what went on. So here's the story. Um, this kid is showing you how things were supposed to go, right? You know, everyone builds the gingerbread house at some point in their, their educational experience. This kid, I, I don't like this kid. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't even, I don't even, I'm sure they're lovely. I know for sure that they're, they're her, this kid's parents are MIT architects because <laughs> she's showing you exactly how it was supposed to be done, right? She also is showing you something, which is they were all given candy. And you can tell because she has color coded hers, right? Well, what you can barely make out is right here at the bottom corner of the screen is the start of a big pile of candy. So Nathan says, uh, hey, what happens to the rest of the candy? Because the parents had to bring it in, right? I'd like to believe he said, could we equally distribute it amongst all students in a fair, <laughs> equitable way? Um, his teacher says, he says, you know, could we take the candy home? And his teacher said, no, you only get to take home the candy that fits on your gingerbread house. So Nathan, he had a goal. He, had a goal. <laughs> he shifts gears really quickly from building a gingerbread house to a gingerbread fort, right? <laughs> I'm talking to him about this. We're looking at the picture, and he is explaining to me in exquisite detail how you get maximal load-bearing capacity <laughs> for a gingerbread fort. And he tried the paste. It doesn't hold anything, right? He's explaining what you had to do is you had to take the licorice, you had to put it on the outside, then you lick it, you put the gumdrops on top of that. He's like explaining, you gotta reinforce the outside, then you can pile it full of candy, right? Some parent captured this, this picture with about 10 minutes worth of work just to get the walls to stay up. And he is really proud of himself. So I thought, huh, first of all, it seems really goal-directed, right? It's not the goal his teacher had for him, right? But that's not quite the same thing as saying Nathan's not goal-directed. But there's a second thing that I think actually does have some value in terms of instructional design, which is, in this case, the teacher introduced the second goal without realizing it. She gave him permission to choose, and he chose more candy. So Nathan was lucky because he had a good track record in class. He's a, he's a good kid. So he got the benefit of the doubt, and I got a passive-aggressive email, right? <laughs> but you could easily imagine a kid that is just starting out or hasn't had the same positive interactions not getting the benefit of the doubt, and how you could interpret that behavior as just willful disobedience. <laughs> and you know, those kids, so maybe the kid gets, hey, I can't believe you can't even follow basic instructions when you get candy. Then the kid talks back, and you know, pretty soon school becomes a bad place. You know? So by the way, uh, I have to say it before I forget. So uh, I love this picture for trying to show goals because they're profoundly important in sort of organizing the whole experience of learning. And we have to be crystal clear, particularly in online environments, uh, what it is we're asking people to do and being uh, explicit about it. But maybe about six months after I started using this picture, Nathan comes home and he says, have you ever heard of royalties? <laughs> Yeah, like somebody told him about royalties, and he said, <laughs> "You have to get something for that." So, hey, what am I supposed to say? Right. So the raise me to get twenty dollars every time I use the image, and I'll, like I'll go home today, and he'll say, "Did you use my picture?" If I say no, he'll say, "Show me your slide." All right. <laughs> so he has a little moleskin ledger in there. So, here's the thing. When it comes to just basic aspects of learning, the brain, variability is the rule. It is not the exception. Historically, we've treated variability as a nuisance variable. It is not. It is information. It is the information. And making the mistake of assuming averages are real, you know, the 2.3 kids are real and your kids are all somehow error off of that average, you 
a family, but uh, the, the problem is, is that buying into this myth isn't just about neuroscience. It extends all the way to learning, and it extends to our ability to recognize what I would call hidden talent, letting students rise and reach their full potential and not creating instructional barriers that actually pick winners and losers. And I want to use the Rubik's Cube to show you what I mean. Because this is a really like simple task. I mean, it's frustrating, right? But how many of you ever tried a Rubik's Cube before? Okay. How many of you have ever finished a Rubik's Cube before? Yeah, that's good. So that's nice. Um, none of you are probably what I would call an expert at it, which is uh, there are a group of people who can consistently solve this in under 30 seconds which is kind of remarkable, right? But what's more remarkable to me th that there is this group of people, if you just Google it, like they have a whole like, they're called speed cubers, right? What's more remarkable th than just that people can do that is that when you dig into that expert space, it turns out there are many different strategies to getting you to under 30 seconds with the Rubik's Cube. So for example, if you're good at rapid pattern recognition, it's, you don't have to remember much. You just have to quickly change your strategy based on every twist of the cube is on the fly. There's a specific strategy for you. There's also a strategy if you may not be so good at that quick pattern recognition, but you can memorize algorithms. If you can memorize 50 algorithms, which I, I don't know how you do that, but people can. If you can do that, you only have to recognize the initial pattern of the cube, and you could do it blindfolded. The thing is, is, I can tell you there's one pattern you definitely don't want to follow, one strategy, which is, as a kid, I really did this. I tore the stickers off, right? <laughs> but I, would, I just wanted to impress my parents, <laughs> right? The thing is, is like, you can totally tell you cheated, and it takes like way longer than 30 seconds. So the, the trick here with just something basic like strategy is that if you wanted to be an expert at the Rubik's Cube, there is a strategy for you, but the best strategy is going to depend on your variability. So imagine if you happen to be very, very good at pattern recognition, but then I put you in an environment where I only taught you that there was one strategy, which is to memorize algorithms. You'd probably look decidedly average at the Rubik's Cube. So that's fine enough. Let's take this one step further, which is still the cube example, and extend it back to that idea of perception and talk about what the impact of variability would be there. So this is TV Raman, who's a colleague of mine from Google. He is a world-class computer programmer. He's invented a lot of really cool stuff. One of the smartest guys I know, and he's been blind since he was a child. So let's just think about this for a second. What kind of, what would we have to do in the environment to create enough flexibility that Raman could actually demonstrate his full potential, whatever it is, right? Well, it, it's obvious that just teaching multiple strategies that we know wouldn't be enough because we have to deal with something more fundamental, which is the way the cube is represented, right? So color is an arbitrary choice. There's nothing inherently true about using color to represent you know, spatial manipulation, right? We could have ch uh, picked something else, right? It would have been equally as true. And people have, by the way. This is an example of what, the, it's a very beautiful uh, Braille Rubik's Cube. And if you think about it for two seconds, you think, that is beautiful. But is it good design? Because now, if you do this, yeah, sure, TV Raman can use that one. I can't. Why did they make it white? <laughs> this is thinking this through a bit, because now we have two cubes, and we lose economy of scale. But it didn't actually have to be that way, right? So if you just thought about it for a minute, about variability in advance, during design phase, not afterward. And you think about the, the dimensions of variability that we expect to be present in a learning environment, and you design for it, you could end up with a cube like this that then has, say, in this case, braille and color. And when you do that, right, you start to be able to recognize talent that would have gone unnoticed, like TV Raman. <laughs> Turns out he's very, very talented, including being able to do the Rubik's Cube in 24 seconds. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? But you have no idea what his talent is without good design. Okay, we are done.
we could have locked him out of demonstrating anything just simply by our choice of a representation, an arbitrary choice. And I say good design is not possible without thinking through variability. What does this mean for education? Because, okay, Rubik's Cube is simple or whatever, you know. But actually, if you think about it, if there's that much variability in something as basic as the Rubik's Cube, think how much variability there is in more complex things like math, science, language, reading, the kinds of stuff that we're trying to teach our students. There's so much more variability here because there's so many more parts that contribute to an outcome. And it usually means there are multiple ways to get to that outcome. But that's kind of the rub because in these environments, it means believing a myth of the average actually hurts us worse because we design away the potential to unlock talent. And we end up picking winners and losers when we don't have to do that. So I want to bring it back to analytics so we get to our panel of actually the really smart people doing honestly really cool stuff. Because you know I play in this field a little bit and I think this the myth of the average is bad enough in design that we keep designing for average, especially in digital environments where we don't have to do that anymore. But it is really dangerous here. Because the thing is, is averages do tell you something, right? But there are certain things they don't tell you, which is about learning. And the thing that worries me is when we take this myth and we start hearing people say, oh, we do adaptive learning. And then you scratch the surface again and you realize they're using averages. They are not doing adaptive learning, right? They're taking this myth and they're baking it into their technology when they never had to do that. And so what you end up with is saying, everyone's the same, you know? This is, we're gonna treat everyone the same. But in fact, when it comes right down to it, it is not like that. The power of analytics is actually in our ability to use data to understand me. By the way, that's not me, so that's probably, <laughs> to understand me as an individual. So the power is not to embed a bunch of assumptions about what we think the learner is supposed to be like and then force them into those pathways. It is to really reduce as many assumptions as possible and make learning an empirical question instead of what I think what it often is is a faith-based initiative, right? Here we go, you know, <laughs> hope it works. But we don't have to do that anymore. And analytics plays a really important role because if you think about what we're trying to do with the learner, it is not enough to have group data to, to tell you about me as a learner. In fact, it's not useful at all. But we need to know not just how I am different from the rest of you so we can embed flexibility, but you also need analytics to better understand how I am progressing as a learner. The kinds of supports that I need in context and when they should be taken away, the kind of pathways I'm pursuing. And the thing is, this sounds like great, yeah? and it's possible, but it's hard work. As you'll see from the experts that we're gonna listen to, these are, they're doing the good work, and what really, really, really worries me is that now that analytics is a buzzword, and all these people are coming in and trying to capture market, that there's gonna be a short game, which is to, to call it you know, adaptive learning, call it analytics, but not really do the things you need to do to transform learning, because that's a longer game. But it's important that we actually lead in this area, and that's just my last point about the, where the value proposition is for UMass. You have all the ingredients necessary to not just benefit from this, but to lead. So think about what you need in this, these new environments. You already have a really fantastic online presence, and I really mean that. I'm deeply impressed with the quality of instructional design in the online environment. And of course, like all of us, we're gonna improve, and we're gonna use data to improve and research to improve. But you're already doing good work. And you also have an incredibly diverse student body. You know variability, like up close and personal. And historically, that's been like, you know it's a good thing, but it's been a struggle in environments that actually are soldered together around averages. But I have to tell you, in, in this analytics-enabled cyber learning, variability is gold. You are, so this is an asset to be nurtured and used to build up these next generation learning environments. And the biggest barrier is to not see it for what it is, to believe a myth and keep doing the same thing. So I think in the long run, what I'm, and just to close, the value for UMass is close the loop, not just get in the learning analytics game, but, but close the loop with design. Because it's, it's not quite enough to have a certain learning design and then sort of bring in analytics on the back end, because you want to have more of a say in not just that you're capturing your data, 
but what data is worth capturing? What information do you need to improve the environment? And in the long run, the real value is if you control the ecosystem, you can start to send the right signals to the right people at the right time. And by that I mean giving the learner the, the feedback they need in near real time, the instructor the feedback that they need, but also the curriculum developer or the person that's created the assessments. I mean, think about how often we say, well, this test has certain psychometric properties. You say, yeah, from like 10 years ago, right? You can make psychometric properties a moment-to-moment -moment decision. Like, oh, this test is actually not that good anymore, that kind of stuff. But just, to, and I think, if I was gonna tell you to dream big, and again, I am you know, down, the, down the red line, you know, don't let everybody else dominate this field. Think, think about the potential for owning the ecosystem. Because you have all those ingredients to be a significant player. And the thing is, I say this and I mean this in all sincerity, we need leaders who have a longer view about this potential impact for learning and are willing to actually see this through to allow analytics to, to actually contribute in the way that I think it can in its revolutionary potential. So that's why, th that's my pitch, and that's my pitch as someone who does not have to deal with your budgets or <laughs> This is my blue sky, that's why I put there. So um, I want to stop, and I want to um, get to the panel, right? Is this? So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.